So we're going to welcome uh, all of you to Ernie Ginsler's presentation on a board member's roles and responsibilities. Are we ready to go, Darren? Ernie? Yeah. We're ready for me? Yes, we're, all right. We're ready for Patricia. People can tell that we're doing this for one of the first times. Certainly I am. So I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ernie Ginsler. I've been working with and for nonprofits uh, for too many decades to remember. Uh, probably going on about uh, 45 years now. Uh, and spent 17 years as a nonprofit CEO and 22 years as a consultant in nonprofit governance, management, and planning. And don't worry, I'm not going to be reading all of the PowerPoints to you. Uh, so that's more or less who I am. Uh, when you've got a question, uh, as uh, Patricia was saying, uh, get it to her. And when I'm taking your breath, she'll let me know that uh, uh, there's a question there. And so I'll Try, I try to uh, ans ask your question more or less at the same time as, or the same uh, approximate time as when it came to your, your head. Don't wait for me to uh, take long, deep breaths. Uh, it's easier for me to come up with an answer if I can remember what I was talking about when you had your question. So here we go. No pressure. Uh, but the board is really the key element of any Rotary Club that uh, influences and creates and uh, sets the tone for your organization. Uh, the board determines whether you're gonna be happy, uh, whether your members are gonna be disheartened, whether they wanna stay around, uh, whether they want to, uh, or whether they want to leave. So no pressure, but it really is on your shoulders. So the first thing we have is a quiz. And uh, I guess Darren will explain how to uh, plug your answers in here. But the question is, to whom is the board primarily responsible? Uh, is the board primarily responsible to Rotary International, to district, to the club's membership, to the board itself, or to someone else. And I think Darren will instruct you on how to, how to uh, set your vote and we'll figure out who's, who thinks which one is right. Well, that was a great idea during practice, Ernie, but unfortunately we don't have the poll today, so we'll just have to move along. Okay, we're off to a really good start. Well, the answer is other. Uh, it's not one, it's not two, it's not three, it's not four, it's other. And legally it's called your fiduciary duty. Uh, and your fiduciary duty uh, is to act at all times in the best interests of the organization. So it's not in the best interest of RI, it's not in the best interest of the club members, it's not in the best interest of the community, you have to act as a board and a board member at all times in the best interest of the organization. If what you're planning on doing may hurt the organization, you better think twice about doing it. <clears throat> Some administrative stuff. Now I'm not gonna be able to see what your answers are, uh, but you need to know about these things. First of all, is your club incorporated? Now, if you're thinking in your head, well, I'm sure it is, it must be incorporated. That's not the same as knowing that your board is incorporated. Uh, if you don't know for sure, then you don't know whether it's incorporated and you need to find out because that's really important. Do you know where your letters patent are kept? The letters patent are essentially uh, what you said you were going to do when you got incorporated. 
So if you're not incorporated, you don't have to worry about this. But if you are incorporated and you're a board member or you're gonna be a board member, you need to know where those letter pa letters patents are kept. Uh, that's one way of making sure that they didn't get lost between one turnover and another turnover. Now, knowing where they're kept is one thing, but have you read them? If you haven't read them, then you really don't know what your club said it was going to do when it became incorporated as a nonprofit organization. So it's important that you know that kind of thing. Uh, does every member of your club have a copy of the club constitution and bylaw? Do you have a copy of the, of the constitution and bylaw? And just like the letters patent, have you read them? Do you have any idea what they said? Now we'll come back to that in a bit. Now I saw a uh, question come down, I think, at some point. Uh, so is there, uh, is Patricia, is there somebody out there who's got a question? Um, yes, question from Dan DeBray. Um, he wants to add a question in with your administrative staff. Are your bylaws up to date and being used? I'm not sure where Dan is um, going with that. Can we unmute Dan and see if I'm, I'm just reading what he's written. Are my, are our bylaws or? Not sure. Let's, let's switch on uh, Dan. No, it was just a comment, Patricia, in terms of there's, there's cases where the bylaws are so dusty and dated that they're in fact not bylaws anymore. They're just a document that was relevant in the past, but not so much in the future. Okay. But, unfor so. but unfortunately, it's the thing that still determines legally. And I should say here, I'm not a lawyer and I can't give legal advice. You sound like a lawyer. <laughs> uh, and probably can give legal advice. Uh, but even if it's dusty and nobody's read it, if push comes to shove and uh, somebody's going to take you to court, you've got to know what it says. So old is no, if it's that old, the board should be reviewing it. It should be one of the things on your board's agenda for this year, for this upcoming year. Re review review all your, your legal documents. Okay. So we'll go on from here. Ernie, I have yeah. another question for you. Oh, okay. um, Doug Vincent is asking, why should a club be incorporated? Many clubs are not. And is there a reason that you recommend that? Uh, sure, well, I, I, yeah, I, actually, I actually come to that, but I'll do it here because uh, this is where you want to know. If your club is not incorporated, then essentially, it doesn't exist in law. What you are is a bunch of people who have come together to do something. Uh, you don't have to be incorporated in order to be uh, a Rotary Club. The benefit of being incorporated is if something goes seriously wrong, then there's a person under law to sue that's not you. And that person under law that they can sue is the club. So it, even if uh, you, know, you, you get to this point, if, the, uh, if, if there is something legally to sue out of the, other than the individuals on the board, uh, and you know, it depends on what, what you're getting sued for, and this is all going to get uh, done in a court of law. Uh, at least the judge has the opportunity of blaming the corporation and not the individuals in the corporation. And if uh, damages are going to be uh, levied, then the corporation can they can be levied against the corporation and not the individual. What you're trying to do is gives the, gives the uh, person who's been hurt somebody to sue other than you. So I hope, I hope that answers the question. So, so the, the next item is, does your club have a current strategic plan? Now I know district has been uh, 
working for a number of years with clubs to develop strategic plans. Uh, so my guess would be that uh, many, many clubs out of the 50 in the district, and I understand that uh, District uh, 7090 is uh, uh, in on this uh, as well. Uh, and I'm not sure how heavily your district has been involved in this. But uh, having a, a strategic plan is one thing. Uh, using it is another. And I'll come back to this a little later on, an, an, on another part of the presentation. There are legal expectations of boards of directors. So we talked about uh, fiduciary duty. Uh, there are three others, duty of knowledge, duty of diligence, and duty to act in scope of authority. And I'm going to address each of these uh, quickly. Duty of knowledge. You actually have a legal obligation to get to know and understand the, artic the articles of incorporation, uh, as well as the internal procedures in the bylaws, the vision, values, and mission, your purpose, and your goals. So these things just don't happen. Uh, if you don't know about this stuff and something bad happens, then that's not good. Diligence. This is a fun one. I love the first one here. Review the meeting agenda and materials. I go back a long ways. So as a CEO and as a member of a board, I can't tell you how many times as people walked into the board meeting and sat down, what they did was they took that uh, big manila envelope that they received in the mail a week before the board meeting that had the agenda and the minutes and reports and all those kinds of things and ripped it open for the first time. So obviously they hadn't reviewed the meeting agenda and material before the meeting. So now that everything is done online, I can't tell who's actually prepared and who actually hasn't prepared until they start talking. Uh, and then you can figure out who hasn't prepared. But you actually have a legal responsibility to review this stuff before you get to the board meeting. You have a responsibility to attend. You can't just join a board and never show up. If, if uh, you're missing too many meetings, it's time to leave the board. Uh, you're legally expected to take notes, review things, all those kinds of things. You're also expected to express your views during the meeting. You can't just sit there and say nothing. I've seen boards where there is a member on the board that just never opens his or her mouth. Don't know why the person's there. The person never talks. You're, you're legally obligated to, to express your views and you're le legally obligated to vote on motions. Now, once in a while, you can say you, if you really can't figure out whether you agree with uh, what this half of the board is saying or what that half of the board is saying and is voting on, and you, you decide uh, not to vote on that motion, that's okay. But if you regularly don't vote on motions when there's uh, any conflict, then the, uh, the punishments on board members if board members are found guilty will come down heavier on board members who do not vote. And just as the, uh, the first responsibility, uh, take actions to preserve the integrity and reputation of the organization. That's really important. Act in scope, act in scope of your authority. So, this, is, this goes back to a few slides ago of knowing what things say. Be aware of the inherent limitations on the activities of the organization as expressed in provincial local legislation policy, your incorporation, your bylaw and other legal documents. You can't do that if you haven't read your bylaw. You can't do that if you haven't read your other legal documents. So boring as they may be, uh, 
this is a, this is a, this is a great time actually. Everybody's trying to figure out. So what am I going to do today? Because it looks an awful lot like yesterday, and it looks an awful lot like tomorrow. Uh, if you happen to have those documents at home, uh, or can access them digitally, uh, especially if you can't get to sleep at night, this would be a great time to re review those documents. The board's role. <clears throat> Determine the mission and values of the organization. You've got a mission. You have values. You have to figure out what they are. Ensure effective organizational planning. You have to do a fair bit of planning to be effective. Uh, lots of uh, clubs have a lot of uh, business people on, on their, in their membership. They know that you have to really ensure to plan to be successful. Well, your club has to plan to be successful as well. And the board is, is responsible for determining and monitoring whatever programs and services it's involved in, whether it's in charge of them or helping with them or not. You need to determine and monitor the programs and services that the, that the club is involved in. Ensure adequate resources. You have to make sure that you've got enough money coming in to do what you want to do. Now, this is a, this is a bad time to be talking about ensuring you've got adequate resources. Uh, most, if not all clubs, spend in this year what they raised the previous year. That's a really good way of ensuring that you've got enough money to uh, do what you said you wanted to do because you're only doing what you said you, you were going to do with what you raised last year. You know ahead of time how much money you've got to spend. Now this year, of course, a lot of fundraising <clears throat> has gone awry. Uh, events have been canceled, events have been uh, put off for months. So it's going to be awfully difficult for the incoming president and the incoming board to figure out what resources they've got because the resources that they're going to look at, resources you've been able to, to raise this year, are going to look very different from the resources that you've got right now. So it's especially important to ensure that your resources are managed effectively. I'm gonna take a second long break here to have a bit of water. Any questions out there yet? No? Okay. Not at the moment, Ernie, thank okay, you. Okay, good. Either they're asleep or everybody's understanding what I'm saying. <clears throat> So manage things effectively, uh, enhance the public image of the organization. And I'll come back to some of these uh, further along. Assess the board's performance. So and we'll come back to that in a little bit later too. So determine the vision, mission, and values. It's important that you have a broad vision of what, where your organization sits probably in the world of Rotary. What do you see as the big picture that Rotary is involved in? And the mission is, what's your part of that? How are you going to contribute to the overall vision of Rotary International and the 34,000 clubs and 1.3 million members uh, of Rotary? And what are your values? What is it that you value most? And do the members of your club share those values? Does the public know about your club's values and Rotary's values? That's important. So I'm using my club, the uh, Rotary Club of Kitchener, to provide an example. I'm not suggesting that everybody write this down and it should be their mission statement, but it's an idea of what our mission statement looks like. And one of the uh, important things to remember about mission statements is they should be short. 
you should actually be able to remember your, your mission statement. And in order to remember it, it's going to have to be pretty short. So the, remember, the mission statement for the Rotary Club of Kitchener is that the Rotary Club of Kitchener is a leading edge community leader that supports the work of Rotary around the globe with a local focus on families and children in need. Where this really comes into effect in my club is if uh, community organizations are coming to the club and asking uh, for some financial assistance. How do we figure out which kinds of organizations we should be looking at to provide that assistance? Well, the missions, our mission statement says we should be looking at families and children in need and a local focus on families and children in need. So that lets us really narrow down uh, who it is that we should be looking at or who it is we should be responding to. Ernie, I yeah. have a question for you, excuse me. Sure. Back, back a couple of slides. Um, the question is, I was under the impression that the board members are also liable to some extent. Please clarify that. Uh, which one is? Where you were talking about liabilities. Yeah. Uh, are liable to some extent for, for, what, for what in particular? Each board member is, is responsible for all the, all the decisions the board makes. I don't know if that clarifies it or not. But uh, you're, you're, the reason that you should be voting at board meetings is to make sure that you've expressed your opinion, especially if your opinion is different from the majority opinion. Romeo, does that answer your question? Did I word that correctly? You're unmuted right now. What? Did I go on? Oh. Romeo? Uh, yes, I'm there. Okay. Um, actually, it, uh, it, it did not. Um, I, I am of the, under the impression that under um, the certain laws of, of uh, incorporation, that the board members are liable to some extent. I don't know if there are any um, lawyers on the on on the call, but um, but I think that is important um, to to make um, folks aware of that. Um, and I don't know whether the same apply for not for profit charitable organizations, etc. But uh, but my understanding is um, there is a degree of liability that's uh, um, associated with with board members on their, on, on this, under the laws of Canada. Yeah, well, and again, I said- Thank uh, you. I'm not a lawyer, uh, but as, as I was saying earlier, uh, the, there are re legal responsibilities that every board member, that every board carries, and uh, the board is the individuals who sit on the board, so, when I say that the, the club is responsible for this, that, and the other, it's the individual board members on that board, as well as the organ as as well as the legal organization, the club itself, if it's incorporated, uh, are responsible for the activities and the actions of that club. I don't know if that helps or not. So I'll try to go on from here. So values. Inclusivity, visibility in our in the work in our community, uh, irreplaceable as a contributor to the individual agencies that we support, and that's uh, that one's difficult often. And bring hope world worldwide and at home. So how do we bring hope at home? Part of that is through fundraising, uh, and actually it's not the fundraising part; it's the funds giving part. Uh, and uh, as I was saying before, this is all going to be a, a little bit different in, for the next year or two. Uh, but that's what the values of our club are. Uh, and again, this is just suggested as an example for others of what a value statement might look like. So, how do you know when you see a well-functioning board? 
Effective organizational planning. Strategic planning, we've talked about a bit, and we'll probably talk about it a bit again, but board planning. At the beginning of uh, the, the board's year, and actually before the board year, uh, and as an aside, I think one of the best ideas that Rotary International ever had was having board elections six months before the board actually takes place, that takes, takes over the role. So elections happen in December and that board comes into power July 1st. So the, the incoming president and the incoming board have six months to figure out what they're going to do in their year. So some of that time should be spent uh, planning what the board ought to be doing, as well as what the organization has, has to be doing. Uh, and so unlike most organizations where you start planning uh, right after the annual meeting and election, Rotary gives us six months to do that. But the board needs a plan for the board. What is the board going to do in the next year? And how is it going to do it? What resources does it need to do? And this isn't what's the organization going to do, but what is the board going to do? Does the board have to make sure that it reviews its uh, letters patent? Does the board have to make sure that uh, it comes up with a more effective uh, way of running the organization? All those kinds of things have to be planned for. Otherwise, uh, two months before the end of the board year, somebody says, gee, in the beginning, we thought we should be doing this and that, and we never got around to it. So the board has to do its planning. Ernie, can yeah. I jump in for a second? We have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, I think people are quite concerned about this liability issue <laughs> on, the board, on the board members. Yeah. Um, I, I hear you when you say, obviously, if you're not a, a lawyer, but can you steer people or give examples um, of things that a Rotary Club might have been sued for in the past? Well, it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a Rotary Club. So uh, it's, you know, any nonprofit or any nonprofit organization can be sued for, for something. But uh, if, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, things that boards have been sued for. Uh, I know of one board that uh, was sued because uh, it, had made, it had made a promise, the, the organization made a promise to do something uh, for another group and then reneged on that. And the group that they had made the promise to uh, took some action based on what the what uh, the, organiz the organization had said it was going to do, uh, it all fell apart. And the organization that said it was going to do something and didn't got sued by the organization that expected uh, some support, that kind of thing. Uh, the other kind of thing that can happen is uh, that you, you plan an event and something goes terribly wrong in that event. So, uh, I had, I had a, a made up example. Uh, one of the popular fundraising uh, things that uh, boards do is uh, at, a, at a, a golf, you know, board, board golf or club golf uh, as a fundraiser. And uh, part of that is uh, a certain financial amount for the person who gets closest to the pin uh, on their first drive. And so there's an award for that. Uh, so my example was, uh, what, instead of having a whole uh, game of golf, why don't we do something that's gonna attract people's attention? We'll hire a helicopter that's used in uh, scooping up uh, water to uh, put on, on uh, forest fires. 
and uh, instead of water, sell golf balls for however much each. And uh, on day X, when the event happens, load the thousand golf balls into that big bag, attach it to the helicopter. The helicopter goes up uh, 50 stories over the practice green and opens up the, uh, the bag and the thousand golf balls come falling out. And the one that's uh, got your number on it uh, is the winner. Now, somebody at that board meeting, when that was agreed to, should have asked, what could possibly go wrong with this? What could possibly go wrong with uh, mm -hmm. 50 stories up, a thousand golf balls falling out of an airplane, uh, probably fairly close to the clubhouse or the parking lot, uh, and a whole bunch of people who've come to watch this happen, and all of a sudden a gust of wind comes up. Well, I just figure what a thousand golf balls can do from 50 stories up over the parking lot. So, you know, somebody's going to get sued for that because somebody's going to get hurt by golf balls. So, that, mm -hmm. that's my example of, uh, okay. of why it needs to, to sue somebody other than you. We, um, we have a couple of other questions waiting for you, please, Ernie. Okay. Um, could you explain the difference between club vision statement and a mission statement? Vision is much wider, much wider. Vision is what we hope the world's gonna look like after we're all successful. We have a vision of a world in which uh, people, people uh, can move freely from place to place. Uh, people are not uh, under the thumb of uh, uh, autocrats. Uh, and people, you know, people help each other in, in times of trouble and, and need. So that's the big vision. Our part of, you know, our part of that is the mission statement. Uh, the mission statement is what we're going to do about this is this. I hope that helps. <clears throat> Dan had a question about uh, could we do a quick poll? I don't know whether that's possible, Darren, um, to see who's aware, <clears throat> excuse me, who's aware of their club's mission statement. Uh, it doesn't have to be a poll, Patricia. Everybody can just go and click on the yes or no button and um, we can count up the yes and no's. So click under participants and then look for a green yes and a red no. And on some computers, it might be under more. And uh, we'll give it a few minutes, Patricia, and then I'll count them up. You're on mute, Patricia. Thank you. Um, Dan's question exactly was, how many clubs have a mission statement and um, are members aware of it? Uh, and... so that's two questions. Pardon me? That's two questions. Okay, so let's do yes or no to... Well, hang on. Let's, we've, we've already... <clears throat> can you not see, Patricia? We've already started. We have 10 yeses and four noes to whatever you'd originally suggested. Let's see it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll keep going. We have 14 yeses okay. and seven noes to whatever was originally suggested. So two to one. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll move on from that then. Um, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt you again in a moment if I may, Ernie. This is okay. Uh, so assessing the board's performance. I talked about having a board plan with objectives. Uh, the board should evaluate its effectiveness every year. And in the best of all possible worlds, there should be an annual board member evaluation where the board gets together and confidentially evaluates the effectiveness of the individual board members. Now, that can be hard to do. Not hard in terms of how do you do it, but what happens when a bunch of people say, everybody but Ernie has done a really good job, but Ernie sucks. What are you going to do about Ernie? Are you, how are you going to, you know, in, in, uh, in our club, the way we elect the board is uh, 
people who want to run for the board say they want to run for the board and there's uh, an election and uh, people vote anonymously and the top eight people, if I remember correctly, uh, get onto the board. Well, in order to uh, have any effect in a board member evaluation, you have to be able to say, maybe, you know, Ernie, maybe you don't want to run for the board this year because when we did our board evaluation, your responses sucked. So you have to be able, you have to be willing to actually do something with the results of that board member evaluation. Uh, if you're not, if, and if your your board really isn't going to be able to do that, then there's no sense in having the evaluation. <clears throat> So, ensure your resources are managed effectively. I've always worked for nonprofits and Rotary Clubs, by and large, have an awful lot of uh, for-profit people in them. So I always figured that uh, the, the members of the club, being business people by and large, would have a really good understanding of financial statements because they're business people. Uh, it may just be the board members who I've, I've encountered or the, or the boards that I've encountered, but an awful lot of uh, business people really don't understand financial statements. A lot of them basically look for plus and minus if we're making money, everything must be good. If we're losing money, something's wrong. But we have no idea how we're making it or where we're losing it. Well, you can't do that as an effective organization. So if uh, your resources, in order for your resources to be managed effectively, you need to understand the financial statements. There have to be financial policies. How much are we going to spend? How do we know when we're spending too much? There have to be procedures and a realistic budget. Are we going to raise enough money to do the things we're promising to do? Or did we raise enough money to do the things we're promising to do? It's pretty easy if all of your grants, if you're making grants, are one-year grants because if you're spending last year's money, you know that uh, you've got enough to spend unless you start spending more than you, you raised last year. But it, the, the spending is also on meetings and meeting places and a uh, bunch of other things like that. It's not all just grants. So do you have a realistic budget that covers all your expenses? Enhance your public image. Uh, it's important that what happens in the boardroom stays in the boardroom. Now you might share it with other Rotarians in your club, but the, the bad stuff, and sometimes there's bad stuff going on, has to stay in the board, in the organization at most. Uh, anybody who starts dissing the board or dissing the organization uh, is a liability and uh, you can't afford liabilities on your board. You have to be, make sure that uh, what they're saying isn't exact, isn't true or isn't as bad as it, they're making it sound, but the board members overall responsibility is to make sure that the good news gets out there and that you advocate for your club and for Rotary in general. Board liability, <clears throat> since we've been talking about that. Directors and officers liability insurance. So there's a district policy that uh, provides directors and officers liability ins insurance for all the clubs. Now I say all the clubs, but I honestly don't know if it covers the clubs that aren't incorporated because the clubs that aren't incorporated are not legal 
persons under law. So I'd check, I'd check that. Uh, and I think I, you know, there are probably some uh, 7080 officials around uh, on this, this presentation who know whether it does. But there's directors and officers liability insurance. What directors and officers liability insurance covers is when things go wrong, even though you've done the right stuff. And that can happen. Uh, it doesn't cover stupidity. You know, if uh, using the, the helicopter and golf ball analogy, somebody should have said, what if there's a, the wind comes up and uh, all the golf balls land on cars and smash 100 windshields. Somebody should have said, what could possibly go wrong here? So board directors and officers liability insurance covers the directors and officers when you've done the right stuff, but bad stuff happens anyway. If you haven't done the right stuff, it's not going to cover you. So. Board liability is based on your accountability and also has to be transparent. You can't be doing things under the table. Club constitution and bylaw. I don't wanna go past our hour limit, so I'm gonna go through here a bit because there's an, uh, another section that follows that's also pretty important. The bylaw uh, is essentially your set of rules. It tells you how you can do things and, and things you can't do. So how do you become a board member? That's in your bylaw. Uh, how, can, how can you disqualify a board member or a member of the club? What happens if you've got somebody uh, in the club who is running around uh, doing bad things legally, him or herself? How do you get that person off your, out of your club or off your board? Because that person's gonna damage the reputation of your club and your board. And all those kinds of things are in your bylaw. Your agenda, your board agenda, your monthly agenda. Uh, indicate which items are for information only so that you don't have to spend time on them. Ones that are for discussion only, and ones are, that are for decision. One of the big th things is, how do you make sure that you've got time to discuss the most important item on the agenda? I've noticed that uh, in many clubs, the agenda takes the same format every month. It's uh, basically fill in the blanks. It's uh, the president's remarks, uh, uh, the business arising, then every committee uh, in alphabetical order or whatever. And uh, what happens is eventually the most, you, you find that the most important item on the board has slipped on the agenda, has slipped onto the bottom because that just happens where, to be where it's all, where that, committee always uh, lands. Do your most important item in the middle of the meeting. That, that makes sure that you've got time to go. Uh, it allows for people who show up late. It allows for people who have to leave the meeting early. So if it's the most important thing to discuss on the other board agenda, put it in the middle, make sure it's got enough time and as many board members as possible will be there. Rotary Charities, <clears throat> gonna spend a little time on this. Half the uh, clubs in the district also have a parallel charity or foundation. And uh, there is a lot of interest by Canada Revenue Agency about the uh, parallel charities that Rotary Clubs have. <clears throat> These are five clubs who had 
who are charitable trusts who are parallel. They were started, they were started by Rotary Clubs who've had their status revoked. If anybody out there in the audience uh, is a member of any of these five <clears throat> and it's still operating, if it doesn't know its status has been revoked, and especially if it's been giving uh, charitable receipts for donations to the trust or foundation, uh, my suggestion would be run, don't walk to the nearest charity lawyer and find out how to get uh, into uh, CRA's good books. Because essentially, uh, all those uh, charitable receipts that you've given to donors are in ineligible. And they've been using them to reduce their taxes. So what's CRA concerned about? There's intermingling of club and foundation committees. So using again my club so that I won't be saying anything bad about somebody else's club. The card draw committee reports to the club board, even though it's run under the charity. And the authority in reporting has to be clear. So you can't have the card draw committee reporting to the club, even though it's run under the charity. There has to be a separation between the club and the charity. They're two distinct entities. And that has to be really clear. So none of the following are allowed. <clears throat> Foundation financial statements are approved at the club, bo club board meetings. Can't do that. The club board does not have any control over the foundation. And the foundation has no control over the club. If all the members of the, cl of the club are also members of the foundation, they're not two separate organizations. CRA is not going to be happy. And likewise, if the members of the club board are the members of the foundation board, CRA is not going to be happy. You can have a couple members of the club on the foundation board, but they can't be the same bodies. You have to, un what you have to understand is they are two distinct organizations. The reason that most clubs set up uh, foundations is because it, hel it helps in fundraising. <clears throat> but there are limitations. Anything you do under the foundation, if they're going to make a grant, charitable foundations can only grant to other charities. So they can't make grants to those small startup nonprofits that have come together to help uh, immigrant groups uh, or to start uh, small uh, meetings for uh, people of different backgrounds or whatever it happens to be that are nonprofits, but they're not charitable. Uh, you can only run, you can only donate to other charities. The biggest reason that uh, the uh, car draw from the Rotary from Rotary is done under the uh, the foundation is that uh, we buy the car and there's HST on the car and you can get a break on the HST if it's bought by a charity. <clears throat> so you get more, so you keep more of your money that way. Ernie, can I uh, inject a question for you here? Sure. Um, there's a couple of questions all on the same topic about um, on a board, let me, let me just make sure I'm doing this in the right order. Um, are you talking about the trust when you talk about the foundation? There's not much difference. And the second part of that question is, should the charities board have non rotarians on it? Uh, well, I'll do the second one first. Yes, 
Uh, as I said, there can be some Rotarians on the board, but the, most of the board should be non-Rotarian, or at least non-Rotarians from your club. There may be Rotarians from some other club. It's, it doesn't disqualify a Rotarian from some other club sitting on the, the board. What you, don't, what you don't want is the, in, the intermingling between the, uh, the Rotary Club of Kitchener and the Kitchener Rotary Club Charitable Foundation. They're separate entities. Now, what was the, <clears throat> what was the first part? Um, about, uh, are you using the terms interchangeably, trust and foundation? Yes. It's just the name of that particular fund. Yes. And um, I think you've covered this one already, but why would an individual Rotary Club create a foundation? That was the legal issue. And um, is it better uh, when members are not members of both boards? Well, I think you've also addressed that, so yeah. I'll, I'll let you move on. Okay. So, winding up on that, ensuring the arm's length uh, relationship isn't uh, isn't there. Uh, it's not just desi desirable. It's a club, and I should say that uh, all the things that I've been saying, CRA says, <clears throat> all the things you've seen on the uh, the PowerPoint uh, are not made up by me. In fact, they were in the letter to the Kitchener Rotary Club Charitable Foundation from CRA after CRA uh, took a look at our club, audited the foundation and uh, found, that, found the foundation lacking in all of these areas. <clears throat> so what I've been doing here is quoting CRA. Be prepared if you're the leader. Facilitate, don't domi dominate. Know what you decided. Uh, make sure that you, you remember what you decided you were gonna do at your last meeting uh, so that it doesn't get lost at this meeting. Uh, know what the tasks are. We decided that this is what we're going to do in the next three months. And more importantly, know who's going to do them. I've seen so many organizations make decisions to, okay, uh, in the next two months, we are going to do this, this, and this, and report back uh, at the end of the three month period. But nobody's given responsibility to do them. The board's not going to do it. Board members are going to do it. And board members are going to do it if they're asked to and so they say yes. But if you don't ask them and they don't say yes, therefore, nobody's going to do it. And you'll come back in three months and say, so why didn't any of this stuff get done? Well, nobody got asked to do it. Questions? <clears throat> Well, people are sprinkling uh, compliments for you, Ernie, all through here. Well, thank you. Um, and I just want to mention, so that nobody leaves before I mention this, that Darren will be uploading, this session has been recorded from the start. Darren will be uploading it. If you go back to the district site, am I right, Darren? Yeah, back to the district site, you'll see all of the pre-recorded sessions and you can watch them as much as you want. And Ernie will see all these comments when he's finished with his presentation. Darren, what, how did that vote turn out? The yes, no. You're, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. 14 yes to seven no. So most people didn't vote. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we've got 33 participants. Okay. So are there any other questions? I know. We're supposed to wind up in about two or three minutes. Yeah, Romeo has a question. I'll unmute him here. Go ahead, Romeo. Still muted. Yeah, actually it wasn't a question. I just used the thumbs up uh, to Ernie for a, a great uh, presentation. Oh, okay, I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, in fact, it was quite, um, quite uh, insightful. 
And um, it, it also gave me some direction because I'm the uh, president elect uh, uh, second time around, by the way, but apparently I didn't do it properly the first time. So they <laughs> pushed me back into the, in, into the spot again. So Ernie, you have given me enough ammunition for me to do it better. And I am indeed grateful. Well, thank you very much. Um, somebody is asking about your uh, presentation, the slide deck, Ernie. Could they have access to that? Uh, or... As long as they understand <coughs> that it's copyright, so they can for their for their own use, yes, and uh, for their own club's use, yes, uh, but not to go beyond that. Um, they will have a, a type of access, right? When uh, yeah. when the whole presentation is uploaded. Yeah. And the cartoons that you use, have they been copyrighted as well? Yeah, they're, they're, uh, I've paid for the use of those cartoons. Uh, and so they're, they're not to be used by anybody else. Okay. And um, one other question, do we have standard guidelines regarding rules of respect, ethics, um, respect towards other members? Standard guidelines, uh, across all of Rotary International, probably not. Uh, I, I doubt even it's uh, the uh, district level that there are standard guidelines. Uh, it's probably been left up to each club to manage that kind of thing, which is not always the best idea anyway. Uh, because uh, if, if nobody is saying you should do this, Club boards are busy. Uh, it's probably not going to get done. So it might be something that a, a district would want to look at, uh, knowing that districts can't tell clubs what to do, but they can certainly offer, uh, offer uh, insightful information for clubs to consider. Okay, do we, do we have time for one more question, Darren? Yes. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Robert. I've unmuted you. Oh, it, it was just in regards to the director guidelines, but I did see uh, from Doug that uh, you can look at the MOP at, at Rotary International. I just thought at the, in this day and age, uh, is there a standard uh, sort of director general guidelines for directors at meetings? Um, because they're often in place now in business that you have respect for others, uh, that you will guide by uh, an ethical approach, that you'll do all the financial, which you've mentioned, uh, and that there's something presented at the, at the beginning of the year to directors, whether there was such a, a guidelines for directors. And uh, I got an answer from, uh, uh, from a friend of mine, and he says uh, there may be something in the MOP uh, from Rotary International, but I just put that out if any, any club had these uh, guidelines. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know whether there are any uh, clubs that do, but uh, maybe if uh, the clubs can get, uh, if there are some, uh, <clears throat> if they can get to somebody, probably to the, to the uh, district, then they could be shared. Okay. Um, the uh, Ernie's email address is right on the screen if people have other questions. And then don't forget, if you go back to the confirmation that you received when you registered for this session, um, there will be a link in there. Um, Darren, it might take a couple of days to get it uploaded, but you'll be able to watch it as many times as you want once it's uploaded. So thank you, Ernie, for an absolutely great, um, this is always a popular topic and great questions, great facts and figures. And hopefully you'll get lots more questions from uh, <laughs> via your email. So thank you everybody for attending. And, um, and don't, everybody don't, don't expect instant response if everybody happens to have a question. Yeah. Although there's nothing to, nothing to do and nowhere to go. Somehow I'm, I seem to be busy. 
<laughs> so thank you everybody for attending and have a great weekend. Thank you all. Thank you, Patricia and Darren.